You're listening to the Mutual Audio Network. Have a good day. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. Each week, the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse brings you classic plays adapted and performed by some of the best in modern audio theatre. And without further ado, here's your host for this week's show. Wow, look at the Cedar. Dad's in those big buildings. I just like coming by the limit. Let's go in. This way, please. Old-fashioned popcorn. <laughs> Aiden, can we have some? We're a little late, Rory. Dad just got us some tickets. We can get some on the break, right? Through there, please. Oh. <laughs> I haven't been to a place since the Nutcracker. Comfy seats. Okay. So where's that piece of paper Dad gave us? Here it is. Welcome to Summerstock Playhouse. I'm Colin. I'm Roy. And I'm Aiden Ward. Tonight, we have a recreation of a classic golden age radio show. A horror show suspense. The Hitchhiker. And it is adapted by the talented folks at Icebox Radio Theater. Oh, is this going to be too scary? Don't worry. Dad said there's no blood. Oh, nuts. Louise Fletcher wrote other great radio classics, including Sorry, Wrong Numbers. The corn's going off. Suspense. Good evening. This is Jeffrey Adams speaking on behalf of the immortal Orson Welles, who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight. But a number of years ago, Mr. Wells was asked to appear on the CBS radio program called Suspense to reprise a role he had played earlier on his own Mercury Theater of the Air, a role created by the great Lucille Fletcher in a play entitled The Hitchhiker. His introduction to that suspense broadcast, which I present to you in paraphrased form tonight, went something like this. The Mercury Theater presented tonight's play for the first time last year. They came right out then and declared it a classic of the medium. No one argued the point. A lot of people asked us to do it again, so it's gratifying to get the chance now. Personally, I never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story, but I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story, and for the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the onset of this evening's entertainment with the sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, axing, poisoning, or throttling here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels or better yet bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then I promise you we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have is a thriller. If it's half as good as we think it is, you can call it a shocker. It's already been called a real Orson Welles story. Now, frankly, I don't know what this means. I've been on the air directing and acting in my own shows for quite a while now, and I don't suppose I've done more than half a dozen thrillers in all that time. Honestly, I don't think it may even be that many, but I do have a reputation for the uncanny, quite possibly because of a little escapade of mine involving a couple of planets, which shall be nameless, is responsible. Doesn't really matter. Don't think I disapprove of thrillers. I don't. A story doesn't have to appeal to the heart, it can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed, sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible tonight, as you listen to The Hitchhiker. I'm in an auto camp. 66 just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, maybe it'll help. It'll keep me from going crazy. 
but I must tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well. Perfectly well. Except I'm, uh, I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a Ford V8, license number 6V7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All of this I know. I know I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it is not me that's gone mad, but something else. Something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. At any moment, the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, mother. Here, let me give you a kiss and then I'll be gone. I'll come out with you to the car. Oh, no, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Hey, what's this? Tears? Oh, it's just the trip, Ronald. I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. Oh, I know, I know, but you will be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or, or drive fast or, or pick up any strangers on the road. Strangers? No, don't worry. There isn't anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or hamburger stand every ten miles. I was in excellent spirits. Drive ahead, even the loneliness. It seemed like a lark. But I reckoned without him. Crossing the Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was he was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. He stepped off the walk, and if I hadn't swerved, if I hadn't swerved, I'd have hit him. I almost did. Almost did hit him. Now, I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I I saw him again. At least, he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointed west. I couldn't figure out how he'd got there, but I I thought maybe one of those fast trucks picked him up, uh, beat me to the Skyway, and let him off. I, I didn't stop for him. Then, late that night, I saw him again. It was on the Pennsylvania Turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I I saw him standing under an arc light by one side of the road. I could see him quite distinctly. The bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain splattered on his shoulders. He hailed me this time. Hello! I stepped on the gas like a shot. It's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides the the coincidence, or whatever it was, it gave me the willies. I stopped at the next gas station. Yes, sir? Uh, Fill her up, would you? Check your oil? No, thanks. Nice night, ain't it? Yeah, it hasn't been raining here lately, ha- has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Oh, no? I suppose that hasn't done your business any harm. No, no, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, though. Ain't seen many pleasure cars out on the turnpike this season of the year. I, I, I guess not. Uh, what about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers here? Why, what's the matter? Don't you ever see any? Guy to be a fool to start out to hitchhike on a road like this. Look at it. You mean you never saw... Anybody? No. Well, maybe they get a lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it's a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't pick up a guy for that long a ride. This is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen anybody like that, have you? Oh, no, no. It's, it's just a technical question. Oh, I see. Well, that'll be a dollar forty-nine with the tax. The thing gradually passed from my mind as a coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. 
I didn't think about the man all the next day until just outside Zanesville, Ohio. I saw him again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I, I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Let me explain something about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor nor was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little. The cheap overnight bag in his hand, he, he looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours, and he hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello! Hello! I'd stopped the car, of course, for the detour, but for a few minutes I, I, I couldn't seem to find the new road. I, I realized that he must be thinking that I'd stopped for him. Hello! After I got the car back on the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit beside me, was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The lights changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. Yep, what is it? What do you want? Well, you sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yep, we do in the daytime, but we're closed for the night. I know, but I, I was I was wondering if you, if you could possibly let me have a cup of coffee, just just black coffee. Not at this time of night, mister. My wife's the cook, and she's in bed. Well, listen, just a minute ago there was a man standing here, right right beside here, and he was a suspicious-looking man. I, I I don't mean to disturb you, but you see, I, I was driving along when I, just, I happened to look, and, and there he was. What was he doing? Nothing. You've been hitting a bottle. That's what's the matter with you. You got nothing better to do than wake decent folk out of their hard-earned sleep. Now, get going. Get on. Well, it looked as if he was going to rob you. I ain't got nothing in this den to lose. Now, be on your way before I call Sheriff Polk. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to rest a little, but but I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. The few resort places that were there were closed. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that... I knew that when I saw him next, I would run him down. <laughs> but I didn't see him again until late the next afternoon. I'd stopped the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks. He was leaning against a telephone pole. It was a perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun, yet yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I, I couldn't stand that. Without thinking blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't even look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheels sharply toward him. I could hear the train coming in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then something something went wrong with the car. It stalled, right on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I I could hear its bell, its cry, its, its whistling cry. And still, he stood there. Now I knew that he was beckoning me. Beckoning me to my death. started. The car started. It worked at last. 
I managed to back up, but after the train had passed, he was gone, and I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on I mustn't let myself be alone on the road for one minute. Hello there, hello. Like a ride? Well, what do you think? How far are you going? Amarillo. Uh, I'll take you to Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas? Yeah, I'll I'll drive you there. Gee. Hop in. Mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. No, no, go, go right ahead. Gee, what a break this is. Swell car, decent guy, driving all the way to Amarillo. All I've been getting so far is trucks. Yeah. Hitchhike much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the brakes. Yeah, I, I think it would be. But I'll, I'll bet, though, you you get a good pickup and a fast car, you could, you could get to places faster than, say, another person in another car. I don't get you. Well, take me, for instance. Su- suppose I'm driving across the country at a nice steady clip, uh, say, 45 miles an hour. Couldn't a girl like you standing beside the road waiting for lifts beat me to town after town provided she got picked up every time in a car that was doing 65 or 70 miles an hour? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe she could. Maybe she couldn't. What What difference does it make? Oh, no, no, no difference. Just a crazy idea I, I had sitting here in the car. Oh, imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? <laughs> what would I do? If I was a good-looking fellow like yourself, I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and relax, and if I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the... (gasps) Did you see him? See who? That man standing there besides the barbed wire fence. I didn't see anybody. Right there. It was nothing, just a barbed wire fence. What'd you think he was doing trying to run into a barbed wire fence? There was a man there, I tell you. A thin, gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. I was trying to run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? I, I was trying to get rid of him, or, or at least prove he's real. But but you say you didn't see him back there? Are, are you sure? I didn't see a soul. And as far as that's concerned... Well, why watch watch for him. Watch for him the next time, and, and keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll, he'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There! Right there! No! How does this door work? I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? Did you see him? No. No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living, and and I don't see how I will very long, driving with you. Look, 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 look. I'm I'm sorry. I I, I don't know what came over me. Please, don't go. So if you'll excuse me... Please, you can't. Go. Listen. How'd you like to go to California? I'll drive you all the way to California. Seeing pink elephants all the way? No thanks. Listen, please. Just one minute. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend. Just a good dose of sleep. There. I got it now. No, no, you can't go. Leave your hands off of me, do you hear? Leave your hands off of me! Come back here, please. Please, come back! She ran for me as if I was some kind of a monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up, and I knew then that I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. Trying to figure out what to do, how to to get a hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could could sleep right here in the car, just just a few hours. Get some sleep just, just alongside of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket. Just as a blanket. Hello! And I saw him coming toward me. Hello! Coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. Hello! I didn't wait for him to come any closer. Hello! Maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out, then and there. And now he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped even for a minute for gas, for oil, for a drink, a pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich, he was there. 
I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was standing near the drinking fountain in a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque when I bought ten gallons of gas. I was afraid now, afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I, I was in lunar landscape now, the great arid mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly across the face of the moon. And now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I could see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in its same attitude over the still and lifeless ground, flitting over dried up rivers, over broken stone cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in the pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself, beside myself, when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There's an auto camp here. It's cold, almost deserted. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling if I could speak to somebody familiar, somebody that I loved, I could pull myself together. Number, please. Long distance. Thank you. This is long distance. I, uh, I'd like to put a call into my home in Brooklyn, New York. This is Ronald Adams. Uh, number is Beechwood 9970. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is your number? M- my number? Oh, uh, it's 312. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico calling. Beechwood 9970. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was in the middle of the morning. I knew my mother be home. I, I, I pictured her, tall, white-haired, in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. It'd be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right. Deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Adams' residence. Uh, Hello, Mother? This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? Who's this? This is Mrs. Whitney. Mrs. Whitney? I I don't know, maybe Mrs. Whitney. Is, is this Beechwood 9970? Yes. Where's my mother? Where's, where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is this a member of the family? What's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. A nervous breakdown. Who is this calling? Nervous breakdown? Breakdown? My mother doesn't have it's nerves. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. The death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what is this? What What number is this? This is Beechwood 9970. It's all been very sudden. He was killed six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Sir, three minutes are up. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. And so I'm trying to think. I'm trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise, 
otherwise I'll go crazy. Outside it is night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa and mountains and prairies desert. Somewhere among them he is waiting. For me. Somewhere. Somewhere I shall know who he is. And who I am. Suspense. The Hitchhiker by Lucille Fletcher was originally produced for radio by the Mercury Theater of the Air, directed by Orson Welles. This production directed and produced for the Sonic Society by Jeffrey Adams. Our cast included Victoria Olson as Mrs. Adams and Operator Number 2, Karen Schickel as the Hitchhike Girl and Mrs. Whitney. Diane Adams played Operator Number One. Dave Irwin was the Angry Diner Owner. And Jeffrey Adams portrayed Ronald Adams and the Gas Station Attendant. For more information on the Icebox Radio Theater, visit iceboxradio.org. This week's showing from Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. All productions, performances, characters, and scripts presented in the Playhouse belong strictly to their respective copyright holders, and no copyright infringement is assumed or intended. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is part of the Sonic Society podcast, and any shows that continue their run must receive express permission from all parties involved. Join us next week at the Playhouse for another classic performance. With thanks to this week's host, I am your announcer, David Alt. Good night. If you produce audio dramas, it obviously isn't to become rich and famous. You love the medium, and you want to share your passion for theater of the mind. The Mutual Audio Drama Network is looking for you. Mutual presents audio dramas every day of the week, each with its own genre. Mystery, sci-fi, comedy, horror, all reaches of the imagination. It doesn't matter if you produced your shows years ago or are still cranking them out. Share them on the world's largest collection of modern audio drama and audio fiction. Give a listen at MutualAudioNetwork.com. And if you'd like to be a part of the excitement, with free access to all sorts of voices, sound effects, music, and more, just drop a line to mutualaudio at gmail.com. The Mutual Audio Drama Network. Why not join us today?